Okay, it says that we are recording. Good. Let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we bless you and thank you for another chance to study your word. And um, if we're faithful, Lord, um, no one goes away from your word unchanged. Something enters into our heart, into our mind, and goes to work like a medicine, helping us to think differently, to understand differently, to have new visions. And sometimes it's subtle at first. Sometimes, Lord, it, it's very eye-opening. Whatever it might be, though, Lord, help us to know that our time spent here with you will be fruitful because it's your word that we're dealing with. Um, and the word of God is not just informative. It is performative and thereby transformative. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so we got someone from Texas, we got someone from Florida, we got a few, uh, what other, any other states that I'm, uh, well, Virginia, of course, DC is part, part of the DC area. Any other parts of the Cal world that, huh? California. Oh, California, David, okay. And, and we got someone that you, there's a new person from San Francisco, so more California. Okay, all right. I'm currently in Illinois. Oh, all right. Dad, so. Ah, hey, hello, sir, all right. Good, okay. What part of Illinois? Uh, right up north near the Wisconsin border, so oh, okay. like northwestern, yeah. I spent my first nine years in Chicago. Yeah. Uh, you know Rockford? It's Rockford. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, good. So we're from all over the place, so thanks be to God, and, um, it's, but it's one word of the Lord. Now, the quick review might, might go something like this. When we, when we began Acts of the Apostles, we're informed by Luke immediately that it's volume two of a two-volume work. So volume one was, I, I wrote to you about all the things that Jesus said and did up until the time that he was uh, crucified, died, rose, and was then ascended into heaven. In the second volume, uh, St. Luke now tries to show us and teach us how the early church got started, what its uh, uh, its early struggles were, as well as its early successes, and um, how things began to take shape. As the cur curtain goes up, the very opening scene, we see Peter at the center, surrounded by the other apostles who remain. There would be uh, 11 of them in all, because as you know, Judas had, um, had uh, um, com killed, com committed suicide. Um, and now he says, that, therefore, Peter makes a decision that his office, namely that of apostle, needs to be filled, all right? So immediately, it's, in, it's interesting, the very opening scene you'd think would be Pentecost, but it wasn't. It was this gathering of the apostles gathered in the, probably the upper room or somewhere there in Jerusalem, and Peter at the center uh, saying that we need to fill this office. He gave some criteria. Uh, they, drew, they, they nominated two men, uh, and a lot fell to Messiah. And... Uh, this is um, how the opening scene begins uh, in the church. Um, there's, um, there's, um, uh, and then in Acts chapter two, <coughs> we see this um, remarkable Pentecost event and how it changed them. They were, they were frightened. The people huddled up in a room together for fear of the Jewish leaders and uh, for fear of what would happen, what had happened to Christ. And so we see that there's a. Um, uh, a great deal of fear and sorrow, and, and, and yet when, when Pentecost happens, their minds are quickened, they're speaking of the bold works of God, they're create, create, uh, courageous, and they go out, and Peter, Peter preaches a barn burner sermon where he gets 3,000 converts. Now, I think you've heard my, my funny joke before that a lot of preachers tell that Peter preached one sermon and got 3,000 converts. I have preached 3,000 sermons, and I have not gotten one convert. <laughs> so, anyway, you know. But it's, it's a funny uh, kind of uh, a rare show of humility from preachers. We, we're, very few of us have humility. <laughs> so anyway, okay. But, uh, and, and so we see that there was a, a remarkable conversion of them. And uh, so, they, so they begin to go forth. And we, we then saw in Acts chapter 3, the beautiful story of the, uh, the, 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 the crippled man. That's the word that's used. It's probably not a politically correct term today. The paralyzed man. Um, uh, who is, is by the gate called Beautiful, and uh, Paul, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Peter and John uh, give, give him light, uh, raise him up, and he dances and goes with them into the temple, and I, I gave you all the, you know, the, the, the sort of the significance of this idea of the gate called Beautiful. He's outside the gate. 
The world can only get him. They can't get him inside the gate. It took the church represented by Peter and Paul uh, through the sacramental life of the church to get him into the gate. And he goes into the temple, into that image of heaven to praise God. And that there's a kind of an image of the church there. And of course, immediately there's a crowd and now all the religious authorities are upset and concerned because crowds bother them because there could be a riot and uh-oh, another one who's claiming to be Messiah may have turned up and we thought we got rid of that Jesus guy and uh, hey, hey, we got a big headache on our hands. And so that's kind of where we left it off, all right? But through this, the church is growing and getting bigger and through this, uh, this exciting time, but also a time of some persecution. Okay, and that's where we open up now with chapter four. Now, before we get into chapter four, I want to give you a kind of a rule of thumb about the Acts of the Apostles, that in a way, what happens to Christ happens to his body, the church. So just as Christ faced a kind of a double enemy of the, um, of the Jewish authorities and, and, and not Jews in general, be careful, because remember, all the first converts were Jews. So this is not some global condemnation of the Jewish people, but the Jewish leaders, especially in the temple, and also the Romans. And these two often conspired to give Jesus a, a very difficult time. And the same thing happens to the church. Um, just as Jesus is confronted by religious authorities of his day, so now are going to be uh, Peter and, and John. And um, just as Jesus, um, you know, again, had to suffer uh, many things on account of them, so now too does, um, does um, the, uh, the, do Peter and John. All right. So with that in mind, um, we left off with Peter giving, uh, remember, there, I, I should write it down again. One more time, I'll write it down. Our $10 word, the kerygma. Now, the, the kerygma, Peter gave a, a very brief sermon there uh, on the Temple Mount, explaining to the people how this, this, this crippled or this, this paralyzed man um, has, has uh, I'm just writing this out. So here's our, our word, kerygma, in case you haven't seen it before, okay? It's just a jazzy Greek term. It literally means the preaching or the teaching, but, oh, is it backwards? Oh, sorry. Okay, okay. But um, uh, the, um, um, the it, is a, it means the preaching, but in a particular, it refers to the six to eight different sermons. Uh, theologians argue whether there's six kerygma sermons or eight of them in Acts. I'd go with the eight. But anyway, all that said, there's a certain content to the kerygma. And so Peter had just finished explaining to them um, how Jesus was healed and this crowd is still there. And rather than re remind you of all the elements of the kerygma, I'll do it again in a minute when we see that Peter repeats he gives yet another sermon, another bit of the kerygma, and you'll see again the same pattern I've been mentioning to you. But we pick up the story. This great crowd has gathered in a temple area. The cripple now has, is dancing for joy, and everyone's excited, and there's a big crowd. Now, um, um, I'm going to ask next week maybe for a volunteer to do some reading. Um, I just... Uh, but. I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but would somebody, if I unmute you, would you like to read? Is that anybody raise their hand and no big takers just yet? Okay, uh, Kate, let me unmute you. And would you read for us? Um, let me see here. Hang on. Should be able to unmute. There you uh, Am I oh. unmuted now? Yeah, you're unmuted. Yeah. Okay. Now, why don't you read um, uh, the, uh, the first four verses, up to verse five, in other words? Of chapter four. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Um, while Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came to them, much annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming that Jesus is the resurrection of the dead. So they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed and they numbered about 5,000. Okay, good. That's a good spot to stop. Now, there's a couple of things to say here about um, the temple leadership was top-heavy with the Sadducees. The Sadducees were 
tended to be in the wealthy class. Uh, the Sadducees had this unusual fact about them that they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. It is said that they only accepted the first five books of the Bible, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They rejected the prophets. They rejected the historical books. They rejected the Psalms and, and so on. Um, they only accepted the first five books, and they claimed that in those first five books, there was no mention of the resurrection of the dead. Uh, and therefore, again, when you're dead, you're just dead. You just go away. You cease to exist. Poof. Now, this is a very odd thing. Um, it's a very rare thing in human anthropology that any large number or group of people completely reject the idea that there's life after death. Most cultures historically, in fact, all of them, um, have, uh, have always had some belief in, in some life after death. It's very natural and normal to the human person. So you generally need to have some odd reasons to sort of not want to believe it, okay? And the answer uh, for the Sadducees is the Sadducees were very invested in this world. These were wealthy men, many of them in the upper business class. They dominated in the temple leadership. They had done pretty well in this world. And it wasn't particularly convenient to them to think that when they died, they would go and face a God and answer to God for what they had done. So it was kind of convenient for them to sort of suppress this truth. And um, why they rejected the other books of the Bible is less clear. Um, but again, uh, they, they were a very um, aristocratic class. And he says, as, as Kate read here, they were particularly annoyed, not just that they were proclaiming Jesus, but they were proclaiming the resurrection from the dead. Now, by the way, um, let's talk for a minute about what we mean by the resurrection of the dead. A lot of people really misunderstand what we mean by it. It isn't that the soul goes on living forever. It is that. And the Sadducees rejected that as well. But what we really mean by the resurrection of the dead is the resurrection of our bodies. Our souls are already immortal, all right? Our souls of their nature are immortal. We will continue to exist in terms of our soul after we die, whether in heaven, hell, or purgatory. Um, the, um, uh, so, our, but it's our body that dies and goes down. Now, the word resurrection, you see the R-E? Because it means to do something again, right? And surrec it comes from two Latin words, R-E, meaning again, and surrexit, meaning to stand up or to be vertical. So re surrexit, to stand up again. Yeah. The Greek words is the same thing, anastasis, to stand up again. Ana, ana again, stasis, to stand up. Anyone know anybody whose name Anastasia? You know, it means resurrection, right? Uh, in, in German, uh, Christ ist erstanden. Hmm? He's standing up again. <laughs> Uh, well, I don't know some of the other languages, but the idea is that that this body that is that we have now uh, will 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 fall into death and into decay, but the Lord will raise it up again and join it again to our souls at the last day. And this is fundamentally what we mean by the resurrection. Okay, not simply that our soul will live forever, but that one day our body too will rise. Now, I realize, and of course, you know, anyone who's over like thirty starts to notice that the decrepitude starts to set in um, uh, and, and the body doesn't, you know, and we, we might not be excited to learn that our body is going to rise, but it will be truly our bodies, but it will be gloriously transformed. We will go from the general model to the luxury condition. Um, we will have an upgrade, shall we say, and our bodies will truly rise and uh, will we'll be joined to our souls. And there will be great glory in our bodies that we do not currently possess. For example, we'll be able to travel at the speed of thought. You know, right now, if I want to go to the black sand beach in Hawaii, where I was in 1968, I'd have to schlep my body onto a plane, which would probably be mostly empty, and fly there and uh, get off that plane and go find the black sand beach. That would take a long time, a uh, better part of a day, and uh, an airplane. And, and uh, funny, but it, it, in my resurrection body, I can think it and be there. Isn't that nice? Uh, I mean, I won't go through all the qualities of our bodies, but they'll have glory. They'll, we will not be wearing clothes in heaven, says St. Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas. We'll be clothed in glory, in light. Um, our bodies will shine forth like the sparks and sh like all the, the glory of God will be reflected in us. And um, um, we will not be able to suffer. Our bodies will be the perfect age. What is the perfect age? Okay, I'll tell you, St. Cornelius St. Thomas, 33. 
<laughs> now, not just because it's rumored that Christ, uh, okay, jo Joy, all right, <laughs> somebody point here, okay. Um, but, but he, and, and this isn't just because, you know, Jesus was 33. Thomas actually reasons and he says, look, there are two things that we can say regarding age, that we have excess or defect. Defect means that we're immature. We're not yet fully mature. De uh, ex I'm sorry, that's, that's defect. Uh, excess means that we're beginning to get older in our body. Physically, we're talking about physically now. Our body begins to be less, we go into decrepitude little by little, okay? So age has either excess or defect. And that perfect spot is right there in the early to mid 30s, right? Where the body and the brain and everything else is fully mature. And um, it's said that, you know, aspects of our brain aren't even fully developed into our later 20s, you know. Uh, so what we start to see is that when we start to hit 30 or 30, or we reach that sort of point of kind of perfection. And then, and then it begins to go in the other direction and we start to struggle uh, with, a, and we go downhill uh, on a banana peel. <laughs> okay. So, but anyway, we'll be the perfect age. Uh, our bodies will need, neither age. We will not suffer. Uh, we will be able to move at the speed of thought. We'll be covered in glory. Um, we'll be able to, uh, um, you know, again, the, 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 well, I, I'll leave it at that, but it, but it will be truly our bodies, but gloriously transformed after the pattern of Christ's resurrected body, okay? Okay, now I don't have time to develop a full uh, theology of the resurrected body. Go to my blog post, my blog, and say, just type in, what will our resurrected bodies be like? And you can read all about it right there. I've written on it, okay? What will our resurrected bodies be like? Okay, now, uh, the, 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 the Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection of the dead, um, and they, they, again, are annoyed, particularly that they, they're preaching the resurrection from the dead. So they arrested them and put them into custody until the morrow, for it was already evening. All right, but notice again, what does this suffering do for the church? Well, as Kate read there, um, we see that... Um, uh, they, they basically added 2,000 more people to their number. Um, never despair when the church is made to suffer. Um, the, the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. Hmm? And very often you will find that where the church is suffering most, she's growing most. So you go to Nigeria, where there are church bombings almost every weekend, where Christians are arrested. We had, there was a heroic story that came out this week about one of the seminarians who was killed and the Muslim man who killed him. The, the, the seminarian was like all of like 18 and the Muslim man who killed him was all of 26. Anyway, he says, as I, as I was killing him, I was telling him, deny Christ. He says, I cannot deny Christ. He's my Lord. I will not deny Christ. Deny Christ. I won't deny him. So I cut his head off, you know. But the man died a martyr. You see, and the church is growing very steadily in Nigeria and in many other places in Africa and Sudan. These are places where the church is suffering grievous persecution, where people are being killed for the faith. So I will simply say to you that um, you see something, some of that here, namely that even though Peter and John have just gotten arrested and they're trying to incite fear in the people, it, just the opposite happens. And 2,000 joined their ranks that day. Okay. So again, do not be too despairing that the Lord allows the church to go through periods of suffering and persecution, all right? Now, not all suffering is producing of many converts, you know. Frankly, an awful lot of the suffering we have in the church today is just due to our stupid, foolish sinfulness and our silence and our fear, you know. Uh, that we're not going to get a lot of converts that way, but I'm talking about real suffering that comes from confessing Christ boldly, you see. That's, that's what grows the church, okay? All right. Now, uh, maybe Kate, I'll unmute and you can go ahead and read a little longer. I'll just tell you when to. Uh, okay. Starting with verse five. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who is sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel 
that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Okay, you can stop there. Um, I would say that, um, that we have another, again, this is a short one, but it is the basic kerygma. Now, what is the basic formula for the kerygma? I, I, you, know, you can look it up in a, in a, in a, in a book, um, and they'll give you all kinds of you know, heady titles and things, but you've heard my colloquial version of it, so let me just repeat it though, right? Here's the basic kerygma. You got it bad and that ain't good. But there is a doctor in the house, and his name is Jesus. And if you will let him go to work in your life, he will save you from the mess you are and the mess you've made. But if you reject him, there's no hope for you. Okay? Now, that's the basic elements of the kerygma. Again, you got it bad. That ain't good. But there is a doctor in the house. And if his name is Jesus. And if you will let him go to light, work in your life, he will save you from the mess you are and the mess you've made. But otherwise, there's really no hope for you. So let's look at those elements here in the kerygma. First of all, you got it bad and that ain't good. So again, you crucified your own Messiah. You crucified the Lord of life, you see. It's in Jesus' name that this man was healed. You guys crucified him. He's the stone rejected by you builders. So you see, you're in pretty bad shape right now. You're on the wrong side of the salvation equation, see. And you've got to understand you are in bad shape. You stand convicted of a very serious crime that you all took part in. You're the leaders of this, of this community, and you conspired to have him put to death. And right now, you're in very serious trouble, all right? But I need you to know, um, it says here, um, he's a stone rejected by you builders, I'm from verse 11 there, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in, uh, in no other name under heaven or earth given to us by which we must be saved. So again, there comes that warning piece, right? So again, he's saying to them, you really screwed up, but you need to see what Jesus can do in your life. Look what he did for this cripple, see? And he can, he can go to work in your life too, see? Um, he, but, but he's the stone you've rejected, but he is the stone. He's the way, and he's the only way, there's no other name given by which you or me or anyone else will be saved except by him. So, my, my, my brothers, you put us on trial. I'm turning the tables on you, and I'm putting you on trial. And I'm telling you right now, right now, you have a decision to make about this Jesus. Clearly, you can see what he can do in people's lives. You need to make a decision about him. Will you reject him and be saved or lost, or will you, will you accept him and be saved? Right? So, again... All those basic elements of the kerygma. You got it bad and that I did good. You did a bad thing. You, you're guilty of serious sin, okay? But there is a doctor in the house. Look what Jesus can do, see? And if you'll accept him, he'll go to work in your life too. But if you reject him, there's no hope. There's no other name, okay? And so there's the basic elements of the kerygma. So it, it contains uh, conviction. It contains hope or an offer of salvation, and it also contains a warning, see, a warning. Now, you notice if you want to compare the ancient kerygma to modern preaching, you're going to see that we, we don't compare too well. There's too much just sort of vague, you know, well, let's hope that we all do a little better. Jesus might want us to try to be nicer to each other, try to be a little kinder, you know, forgive. And now, you know, try your best, and um, let's hope it goes all right, and you'll probably be fine. You're all decent people, so let's stand for now for the creed, you know. So again, where's the, where is the, the drama, you know, uh, that you've got it bad and that ain't good? You know, where, where is the reminding people that you really need the Lord in your life? Where we talk honestly about sin in our lives, see? That's too often absent in preaching today. Likewise, where is the, uh, the we also, may, maybe the idea that, yeah, there's a doctor in the house and his name is Jesus. But doctor is too strong of an image for most people. Pardon me, Dr. Kate and uh, Dr. Stephen, but doctors kind of tell you what to do. And they do what you got to do. And we prefer, I don't know, a harmless hippie. 
we prefer a suggestive teacher. We prefer sort of a, a kind of a hayseed who walked around. So again, even the term doctor is a little bit too strong for people, right? Um, but again, so doctors have this nasty habit of saying, this is what you need to do. So Charles, you need to change your eyeglasses and start wearing these, you know. Well, that's gonna be expensive, Dr. K. I know, but you gotta do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, or you need to take these eye drops, or we're worried about, you know, or Dr. Stephen, you know, especially in your line of work uh, in psychiatric medicine, you know, a lot of people come wanting relief, and, you know, you can't just give them a pill all the time, you know, people just need to work hard to get well, you know, he, you know, people want relief, not healing, healing is hard work, see, all right, so anyway, we'll leave it, at, you know, we'll leave it at that, but you see the basic elements of the kerygma, and too often they're missing today, and then there's almost never warning. You know, warning. Now, I'm not saying that you should be, every priest should be banging the pulpit and telling everybody, you're all going to go to hell. Uh, you know, but there should be, though, this warning that sin has real consequences. Both, not just about hell, but just even in our life. You know, look what terrible suffering comes from all the irresponsibility. Too much drinking or smoking, you know, what that does to your lungs and your health or overeating, you know, or what that does to your health or sex, you know, with all the STDs and the abortions and the single motherhood and absent fathers and on and on I could go. I mean, you know, you, you see the vision. I mean, so you don't even have to wait for hell. You know, the sufferings and the consequences come pretty quick if we, if we get out of line with God's will for us, see? And uh, so anyway, much of this is lacking in modern preaching, I would argue, okay? And I try to work with my brother priests um, on, on retreats, but you know, we got anybody, we all get set in our ways, you know? And, um, I work with them as much as I can, and I have a whole day I spend on them on preaching, you know, on the retreat, and um, so I'm trying to do my best to go out there and help brother priests. Not that I'm perfect, I'm, not, I'm certainly not a perfect preacher, but I mean, you know, I think at some level, though, um, it, it's just been really put deeply on my heart over the years that there's just so much lacking in modern day preaching, all right? I blame it, by the way, on the microphone. Uh, the invention of the microphone destroyed preaching. In the old days, you had to preach like this because <laughs> there was no microphone. And that, of course, affects, you know, the whole person. And you begin to become more emphatic and prophetic and you raise your voice. And then they invited the microphone and, oh, my dear brothers and sisters, welcome. And I hope you're all feeling good today. And um, let me suggest to you, uh, you know, and, and so pre preaching went from loud to sort of soft and suggestive. <laughs> anyway, it's it's just a theory. Okay, I, I but I am laboring too long on this. But you you see the kerygma again, right? Okay, and we're going to see some more examples of this. So um, we'll, we'll continue on. Now, I, I love these next verses. Um, just just frankly, um, all I'm going to ask you, Kate, is to just just read verse thirteen. Just verse thirteen. It's such a it's just a wonderful verse. Would that it were so true of all of us. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they were amazed and recognized them as companions of Jesus. Okay, just stop right there. <laughs> wow. Now, I mean, what a verse. <laughs> what, I mean, this is, this, you could spend a long time meditating on this verse, all right? Now, look, look think about this for a minute. First of all, I want to unpack the word boldness for a minute. It says here in this verse, um, when, they know, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. In English, the word boldness kind of has the, the implication of um, brash or arrogant, right? But the Greek word is parasia. And I think we may have talked about this in a previous class, that this Greek word parasia. is not parousia, which means that's about the second coming, but the Greek word here is parasia. And it, it is properly translated boldness, but it's not a, a, it's not like English boldness, like, you know, in your face and kind of arrogant and um, uh, like that, but rather it's a serene, confident, um, a confidence based in having had an experience where you know what you've seen and heard, and you speak with confidence, with serenity, and with a, a straightforwardness, there's no caginess. There's no cloaking of words. It's just a very plain spoken, clear message of someone who has no doubt about what they're speaking about. Okay. And that's parasia. Now, um, the, um, uh, 
was going to say something about it. Uh, well, I don't know if any of you know the story of St. Bernadette Subaru, uh, who uh, was a visionary at Lourdes, France. And she was just a little girl, in fact, a very little girl. Uh, I think all, she, all, in all her life, she never grew any taller than four foot three. She had been uh, starved as a child. The family was very poor, and her growth was stunted. And, uh, but uh, she, she had had these visions, and she told them to the parish priest, and you know, he brought it in. Anyway, she was counselor, you know, interrogated by the town officials, by, by church officials and all this. And she just simply spoke very plainly. This is what Our Lady said. I don't know why you keep asking me to repeat it. She had no agenda. She just said, she just looked him in the eye, all of four foot two. She looked him in the eye and said, I saw what I saw. I heard what I heard. And this is what it was said. And they could not overcome that. They, they were so impressed by her, just serene, confident, Again, parasia, boldness. So just trying to give you an example of that from a womanly point of view, you know. Here you got two men, but uh, uh, parasia for this, you know, this young girl to simply look at these authorities who threatened to put her in jail because they didn't want to draw crowds to some superstitious thing. You know, they, they had all the reasons. But at the end of the day, um, there was also political turmoil, all these things that made them worried about a crowd. But at the end of the day, she just looked at them and said, look, I saw what I saw. I heard what I heard. If you want me to repeat it one more time, I will. But this is what happened. Okay. And that simple, straightforward, confident answering just impressed them. It was very impressive. Brought the parish priest over to who believed her. And little by little, then the spring came and all the other things began and the miracles started to flood in. So, okay. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and, and they perceived that they were uneducated common men. In other words, they're speaking with a kind of a clarity. They're speaking with a, um, a, a not just in terms of vocabulary, but a serene, confident, you know, they're not like, well, man, I don't know. I was up there and I was, you know, and I don't know what to say to you. You all are real important dudes. And what am I supposed to say? You know, they, they didn't have any of that kind of, you know, I'm, I'm just an old, you know, I'm an un, uneducated man and I'm just talking simple. Um, you know, pardon me for using that kind of an accent, but you get, I'm just trying to illustrate. They don't come across that way. They realize these are ordinary, uneducated men. Um, where, where did they get this clarity, this boldness, this ability to work a miracle? And they recognize, oh, ah, now I know why. These men were with Jesus. <laughs> they unintentionally tipped their hat. Uh, to Jesus. So here comes the question for every one of you, including me. Do you have something about you that can say to other people, how are you this way? Like when we're all in the office politics and the long knives are out and we're stabbing each other in the back and the gossip is flying and the whatever the foolishness going around, you're kind of serene. You don't get all involved in that or you stay joyful even in the middle of difficult times. What, what is it about you? Do they recognize, ah, you've been with Jesus? Is there something about you that they could say, ah, you've been with Jesus, haven't you? See? See what a powerful line this is? So let me just read it one more time. When they saw, and remember, these are, these are the big power brokers. This is the big Jewish Supreme Court. That's like being in the Supreme Court up the street here. And you got all these big, big, biggie wow judges and big educated, you know, blah, blah, blahs, and they're all theologically educated. And they, they, they said, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they didn't, they didn't wear all the rabbinical cloaks and all the insignia of rabbis, none of that, right? When they saw this, they, they were uneducated men, they were amazed. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Now, that can, of course, be understood. Uh oh, he, that's right. He, they were one of his disciples. Oh, no. But I, I just want to interpret it as just, wouldn't, isn't that the greatest thing? You've been with Jesus, haven't you? I see the glow on your face when you come back from Mass <laughs> or Bible study. <laughs> you, you've been with Jesus, haven't you? Hmm. Isn't that really the goal, right? And also to give you and me parasia, which is that boldness 
Um, but again, not the English meaning of it, this sort of arrogant in your face, eh, heck you, you know, uh, but rather that, that, that serene, confident, articulate ability to articulate what you've seen, what you've heard, that you know who you know, and you know you've met him, and you know what he's told you, and you have no doubts whatsoever about what's right or wrong in terms of what's going on, and you see the vision for your life, you know where you're going, and you're not like your life, it's not like your life is sin free or you never suffer or have a bad day, but people see something in you that say, you've been with Jesus. There's something about you, you know where you're going with your life, you have a vision, you're not easily unsettled, right? St. Thomas Aquinas in the Summa talks about this uh, Latin word that called beatus, is where we get the word beatitudes. Beatus is, is translated happy into English, but as Thomas points out, we must be careful to understand that beatus is not just some quick passing emotional happiness, but that beatus indicates a stable, serene, confident joy that is not easily taken away, okay? So it's a, it's a disposition. It's a kind of a flourishing in your life that goes on as a consistent state and is not easily uh, taken away or removed or covered, okay? And that's the same thing here with this kind of parasia, this boldness, right? Where does it come from? It comes from being a witness. And you've heard me on this before, this idea of being a witness, you see. So there you are in the courtroom and you've been sworn in and the attorney comes and said, did you see so-and-so do such-and-so? Um, I think so. Does that sound like a witness? Does that sound like parasia? Hmm? Um, or did you see so-and-so do such-and-so? Um, well, that guy over there told me, no, no, no. I'm... Okay, now here's Padacia and here's witness. Did you see so-and-so do such-and-so to so-and-so? Yes, and I'll swear to it. Saw what I saw, my own eyes. Here's what happened. Okay, that's a witness. Now, you see, what happens too easily for us is that we are just content to sort of manifest or profess our faith by what other people have said. And that's not all wrong. Don't get me wrong. I hope you do quote the saints. I certainly hope you quote scriptures. I certainly hope that, you know, your mother, your father, your preacher, or maybe something I've said is memorable. You say, you know, I heard my pastor say, but there has to come a moment, brothers and sisters, when you say, and I say to you, where, you, where people know that you, what you're saying is true because you know it's true, um, that you have this, um, you don't just know ab uh, about what you're talking about you know what you're talking about, okay? Can you follow me? Okay. So, like I say, that line, verse 13, is certainly worth um, studying. Okay, Kate, how you doing? Or should we get someone else to help? Or how's your voice? Okay, read some more. Uh, when they saw the man who had been cured standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. So they ordered them to leave the council while they discussed the matter with one another. They said, what will we do with them? For it is obvious to all who live in, Jesus, in Jerusalem that a notable sign has been done through them. We cannot deny it. But to keep it from spreading further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in, his name, in this name. So they called them and ordered them not to speak or teach it all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in God's sight to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot keep from speaking about what we have seen and heard. After threatening them again, they let them go. They let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all of them praised God for what had happened. Okay, for so them, stop there. Okay. Now, again, from what you've seen already, this recognizing the boldness of Peter and John and so on, and notice how changed they are from the fearful men they were before Pentecost, especially Peter, right? Now, um, <clears throat> do you really think that they can intimidate them? You see, they say, well, we, they take counsel among themselves and they say, you know, what are we supposed to do? I mean, obviously the sign has been worked. Um, and, you know, what can, what can we do? Um, a notable sign, uh, and uh, it's manifest, uh, we, so we can't deny it. Um, so, but let's threaten them. 
uh, let's threaten them to speak no more in this name, okay? <laughs> I mean, we, they, they've already noted how, uh, you know, the bold confidence that they have, right? So again, they don't really know what to do. So they try to say, don't you do that anymore. Don't, don't threaten, or we threaten you. Uh, don't, don't do that again, okay? So, um, um, but here again, this is then again, notice the respect that Peter and, and John have. They don't simply berate the authorities. I got to listen to the man, you know, stuff, you know, it's not, it's not like one of this sort of, uh, uh, no one, nobody's going to tell me what to do, you know, get out of my face, you civil authorities, you know, um, that's not how they deal with it. They, but they actually put it back on their conscience. All right. And they say, now look, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, uh, whether to, that we should listen to you rather than to God, you must be the judge of that. What would you do in our place? In other words, right? And so they simply say, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Oh, would that the average Catholic could, could say that. Hmm? For we cannot but speak of what we've seen and heard. Now here comes, a, 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 there's a lot of problems related to this, right? Um, when you think about it. Frankly, let's start out with the, with the beginning of the problem. Most Catholics don't expect to see or hear much. I'll go to mass and, you know, I'm, I'm, again, I don't mean to pick on Catholics. Uh, I mean, uh, and I'm certainly not saying it's true of every one of you individually, but I think we all know that there's a lot of people in the church that see the mass more like getting a flu shot. You want to go and get it over with as quickly and painlessly as possible, you know? And you don't really go there expecting much. You're not really expecting a good music or a good experience of fellowship. Uh, you're not really expecting to hear a great sermon and, you know, you're going to go up and get communion. And again, look, many of you are above average, but you get the idea. There's a lot of this in the church, right? People don't really expect much from the mass or from the sacraments. It's kind of just a, a ritual. Thank God they come at all. But of course, the last generation that really had it preached to them that you got to go to mass, or you might go to hell, uh, is dying out now. And I mean, thanks be to God, I think a lot of you go to mass much more intentionally than generations before you, like mine and the one before them. We went more out of, you know, well, it was a social thing you had to do, respectable people went to church, so I'm respectable, so I go to church. It wasn't like we were on fire with the love of God and, you know, that everything was, you know, great and holy and, you know, all that stuff, but it sort of did it for cultural inertia. An object in motion tends to stay in motion. And although it looks great if you look back to the church in the 50s and churches were packed, the thing was about 2,000 miles wide, but only maybe two inches thick. And when the sun came up, it all broke up pretty quickly and melted because it wasn't based on some really powerful understanding. I really need the medicine of the sacraments. And, you know, when I go to mass, I'm being changed. My heart and my mind are different, you know. So, again, I think it starts with the problem of low expectations. Most Catholics don't really expect much. One of the reasons they don't expect much is because people like me don't tell you to expect much. Now, I hope that uh, you'll see that I tend to be an exception to that, right? I mean, you need to expect a lot from your relationship with God. Now, we all, you've heard me say these things before if you come to church here. We all expect in life to meet people. And having once met them, our life is never the same, for better or for worse. Oh, but just like to good examples, there's a teacher that you had who really inspired you and opened up to you. Maybe you never thought you were good at math, but this teacher just inspired you. And all of a sudden you discovered you had a talent. For me, it was writing. I had a, a literary teacher, uh, a grammar teacher, English teacher in, in high school. He said, you've got a gift. And uh, he, he, he was tough on me. He would grade my papers extra tough. Um, he said, you've got a gift. You need to work at it. And I did. And I've been a writer ever since. And uh, I've written a lot. I actually earn more as a writer than I do as a priest. It's kind of funny, but you know, that's not saying much because we don't earn much as a priest. But, but that said, I mean, uh, I, I, I think that, um, you know, maybe, uh, we, 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 maybe it's the person who offered you your first job or opened a career path for you by hiring you. Or, you know, there, but we all expect to meet people in our life that having once met them, we're inspired or a path is open to us and our life is never the same again. And if that's the case with simple human beings, shouldn't it even be more the case with the very God himself? And yet most people, are, well, you know, and most people really haven't met him. He's more of a stranger. He's someone they've heard about in the pages of a book or he's up in heaven somehow. Somehow I vaguely know he loves me and has taken care of me, but I don't really know him. 
And so what I want you to think about, and I'll, I'll give you this idea to maybe build up on, here's a prescription for you, okay? I really want you to think about what the mass is and the sacraments and realize, and I'm just gonna give you this testimony, most of you who come here have heard me say it before. But I, I have been, I'm, still, I'm getting, I'm knocking on the door of 60, I'm not quite there. But for 35, the first 30 or so, maybe well, let's say the first 27 years of those, you, I wasn't that serious about my spiritual life. But after that point, when I entered the seminary, I went to mass every day. I went to confession once a week, received communion every day, read scripture every day, prayed for an hour every day. And I'm going to just tell you here, 32 years later uh, as a priest um, and 37 years or whatever since I entered the seminary, I'm a changed man. I'm not what I want to be, but I'm not what I used to be. The word of God has changed me. I think differently. My, my vision is different. My priorities are different. Receiving communion every day has helped me to become more holy. It has helped me to be strengthened as food for the journey. Getting to confession has helped me to cleanse my soul and see sins rooted out of my life. And I, I could go on and on with this testimony, but I, I, I want you to understand the sacraments are our medicine and this medicine works. It, it's not the type of medicine that usually works just like that, but it, the cumulative effect of going to mass every Sunday hearing a word from God every Sunday, preached to me, read to me, sung to me by the choir, I myself celebrating and preaching it, but also receiving and hearing it, has changed my life. Why? Because the minister of every liturgy isn't a father pope or a father whoever, it's Jesus. He's the, he's the true celebrant of every mass. He's the true absolver when you go to confession. He's the true priest who's ministering to you. And you encounter him in a liturgy. You hear his voice. He touches you. He heals you. He lays hands on you when you're sick. He, or, or when you go to confession, he, he feeds you with his body and blood. He speaks to you. He's present to you. And if you're prepared to accept it, he's talking to you right now. Okay? So, yes, he uses this broken person of a human person, and my own personality may get in the way, but I hope that over the years, as I've gained a better relationship with the Lord, that you can hear from me at least something of a boldness, a parasia, a certain serenity that comes from knowing and witnessing, as someone who's been in the presence of Christ, spent so much of my life listening to him, you see. And so I promise you that, again, these things, we, we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. So the goal for you is to become increasingly aware of what you see and hear in every liturgy. So my prescription for you is go to Mass with high expectations when you can again. Ugh. But um, go to Mass with high expectations. And even in the poorest sermon, there's a nugget in there for you that God has for you, just for you. Something for you to hear that you can take with you. You certainly receive him in Holy Communion. And there is fellowship, and I don't mean coffee and donuts, but I mean that deep fellowship of being with the body of Christ throughout the world. We're caught up into the church, into the church uh, triumphant in heaven and the church suffering in purgatory. We gather in this magnificent gathering of all God's people throughout the world and across time. And uh, we're there and we worship. And there's that beautiful moment in every liturgy where the priest says, Sorsum corda, lift up your hearts. That means, brethren, we're in heaven now. We're in heaven now. See, We've been caught up into the holy of holies where only God the Father can, can be. But we're there because we're a member of the body of Christ. And we have a perfect right to go into that holy of holies as a member of the body of Christ. And we hear and we join the seraphim in that song that was only sung in the highest heavens, overheard by Isaiah. Holy, holy, holy. I know we need to do a lot of work on liturgies to make them maybe more mysterious, you know, bring back the mystery and the awe and the wonder. But at the end of the day, I want you to be aware, see, so that someday, not just someday, but even now, you can run out and say, I cannot but speak to you of what I've just seen and heard. Because at the end of the Mass, you're told, the Mass has ended, go forth now. It doesn't mean just go home, have a nice day. It means go tell somebody what you've seen and heard. Be a witness now, see. I have no one else in this world to witness but you. You go now and tell people what you've seen and heard, okay? Every now and again, parents will say to me, you know, my kids don't want to go to church anymore. I can't understand. I tried to raise them right, Father, blah, blah, blah. And I say, well, to the parents, why do you go to Mass? Because uh, it's a rule. <laughs> okay.
okay, <laughs> if that's all you got, right? But you've heard why I go to Mass, right? I go to Mass because the Lord puts on priestly robes and he ministers to me. He hears my complaints and he, he gives me a word to get me through the week. And I'm powerfully moved by that word. I can't believe some of the beautiful things I hear. And then he feeds me with his body and blood. And all these years of going to Mass, I'm a changed man. That's why I go to Mass. Now, how different would it be if we talked to people like that? And, you know, even we priests, you know, we hide behind our vocation story. We love to tell the story of our vocation, how I became a priest. Well, I met so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. My, my vocation story is I joined the, the church choir to meet girls because there are a lot of pretty girls in the choir. And that's how it all got started, okay? And eventually I, I worked my way up through the ranks and became the choir director, the organist, all that stuff, and began to realize I liked the church and yada, 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 and I became ordained a priest. I met some priests that inspired me, et cetera. Okay, but... Too many of us priests hide behind the vocation story. How about this, Father? How have you met Jesus Christ? When did you meet him? And what's he doing in your life? See, you don't even hear priests talk like that, do you? See, you might hear some. Hopefully you just heard me. But I'm telling you right now, we don't talk like this. Okay? And that needs to change in the church. Okay? Now, we all have different personalities. But I'm a lot more shy than most of you would, would, would uh, know. I'm very shy. I, don't know. I have a priest buddy, my father, Mike Salah, if any of you know him. We go out to a restaurant. He's, he's introducing himself to half the restaurant. I'm, hey, we're priests. Blah, blah, blah. Hey, where are you? I'm like, oh, God. I'm just, I'm, not, I'm shy. I just want to go there and have dinner, you know. And, and suddenly, you know, the whole restaurant's standing around us, you know. God bless him, though. He's probably, that's probably more the way I should be. But what I'm saying is to you that I've had to learn over the years that people, Simply giving information isn't enough. People want to know that you know what you're talking about. Witness, people want to know that you, you've witnessed and you know that it's true. See? So you can say, it's great, great. Jesus loves you. He died for your sin. And they say, that's all good news. How do I know it's true? And you've got to be able to say, look at me. Look what's going on in my life and be able to be a credible witness. Okay, so that's the goal. All right, well, I certainly spent a long time on that. Um, but you see how important it is, right? It's a whole ecclesiology there. All right. Now, um, uh, verse 22 and following. So, Kate, let's why don't you can continue and we'll be our designated reader for the whole night here. All right. For the man on whom this sign of healing had been performed was more than 40 years old. After they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard it, they raised their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and, heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, it is you who said by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, why did the Gentiles rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of earth took their stand and the rulers have gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For in this city, in fact, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, gather together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look at their hearts and grant to your servants to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When they had prayed and when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, the whole group of those who well, believe. Let's, let's stop there for a second, just before we do the final section. Mm -hmm. you, you'll notice uh, a couple of things here. Um, first of all, notice again there how anointed their minds are. Um, one of the first things you notice about Peter's very first sermon on the day of Pentecost was he was pulling scriptures out of different prophets and stitching them together and just applying them. And so one of the anointings that's obviously taken place for Peter as well as for John and the rest is that they're able to see and understand what they're going through in the light of the scriptures. Now, what is scripture? Scripture is a prophetic declaration of reality. What I mean by that is that um, it's telling you what's really going on. Whatever you think is going on, this is what's really going on. Now, 
Another thing you need to remember about scripture is that it's not spectator sport. You're not just reading about an event that took place 2000 years ago in some other people's lives. You're, this is your story. You're in the story. If you're prepared to accept it, you're the crippled man who got healed. But if you're also prepared to accept it, you're Peter and John are the other apostles. You see, so this is your story. And, and so the idea is that we want to be able to see how a story like this applies in our life. And that's what I've been trying to do with you. But notice even there, while they're there, they're saying, you know, this whole thing we just went through reminds us of Psalm 2. And they just quote most of Psalm 2 there. Why do the nations rage and the kings uh, and the peoples conspire together? The kings rise up and the rulers of this earth take plot against you and against your anointed. So they see themselves as living out this scripture. And say, this is our life. This, this describes, this is a prophetic declaration of what we just went through and are going to keep going through. And uh, thank you, Lord, then for this insight. God said, you see? You see, this psalm was written a thousand years ago by David, but it's now alive in your life, see? And so this is, uh, this is that anointing that we should all look for. Now, for me, I've noticed that I, I have this, I would maybe, maybe I would call it a charism, I don't know. It could be just that I've been reading scripture for so long. But even as a young priest, I was always amazed at how my mind lit up with scriptures as I was preaching or preparing a sermon. I was like, where did I get all this? It's not me. It's an anointing, see, that can come from the Holy Spirit. I don't argue that necessarily everybody receives it, you know, like that. But, but I would say that it's available to almost every Christian who applies themselves to the study of Scripture on a consistent basis. After a while, these Scriptures just stick to your ribs. They're just there. And you remember them, and they come, they come up when you need them. And the Holy Spirit, of course, prompts you to remember. And um, so I'm always amazed. Um, when, I, uh, when I'm preaching or whatever, how things sometimes just suddenly pop in my mind. And I'm like, wow, thank you, Lord. Uh, but you, you, you see, therefore, this anointing they have and that their minds are applying the word of God and seeing their life through that template of scripture, which is a prophetic declaration of reality. Now, it goes on to say they then recall everything that happened to Jesus. And in effect said, because remember, the gospels aren't written yet but they've lived the gospels. And now they're saying not only what David wrote, but they're saying, look what happened to Jesus. And now we're sharing in, that's why I said at the beginning of this class, as we get close to ending tonight, this idea that what happens to Christ as he walked this earth now happens to his mystical body. He's going through the same, the same things are repeating, all right? Why? Because your life is the Paschal mystery. As St. Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 10, you are, we are always caring about in our bodies the dying of Christ so that also the rising of Christ to new life might be manifest in us. So what is your life? Well, uh, I'm a teacher, I'm a lawyer, I'm a priest. I'm a, okay, you're not answering at the right level. Your life is the Paschal mystery. The Paschal mystery is that Christ has died, he has risen, and he will come again. So you're always caring about in your... So next time somebody says, how you doing? Say, always caring about in myself, the, about the dying of Christ, so that also the rising of Christ may be manifested in me. How about you? How are you doing? Okay. <laughs> I'm being a little silly, but that is your life. Okay. And that's kind of what they're, they're seeing here. Ah, our life is plunged into the Paschal mystery where we die with Christ and are buried with him in the waters of baptism and rise with him to newness of life. That's our life, see, and they're applying it. Now then, we also have here what happens, it says here, um, and when they had prayed, the place where they were gathered together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. Now there's that word again, parasia, hmm? the boldness, right? Now notice the place shook as they prayed. Is this what our liturgies look like? Now, look, I'm not saying we've all got to be wild charismatics, you know, jumping up and down on the pews and so on. But, you know, a little joy sometimes wouldn't be a bad thing to manifest. You know, like too many of us are like this at mass. You know, like looking like we just sucked a lemon or something, you know. It looks like we're at a funeral more than at a wedding, right? Now, again, I understand what happens. You know, we, 
we're trying to pray and be, you know, our face, you know, comes kind of drops and all that. But, you know, the more you realize, though, you're in the presence of God and God is ministering to you, you're like, oh, you know, you look, your face looks different. You're alert, you're alive. You don't have to necessarily be going like this. You could be praying like this, but you're alert, you're alive. God is here. He's ministering to me. He's speaking to me. You're not like, you know, as you too often, we often, too often see. So the idea is that our prayer should be something which makes the place shake. It makes, make, and shakes us and, and brings us and rouses us to great, to great things, you see. And this is the vision. Okay, so Julia, you have a question? You want to just unmute and ask it? Quick question. Sorry, Father. Um, I just had a question about the line 28 that says to do what your hand and your will had long ago planned to take place. How are we supposed to take that? Because initially I'm like, this sounds a little predestination each me. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, by the way, it, there is Catholics do teach predestination. We just don't teach double predestination, <laughs> which means that God, God destined some people to go to hell. But de destination means God has always known what we would do. Remember, God lives outside of time. He's not waiting and wondering what you're going to do tomorrow, Julia. Your tomorrow is just as present to him and has always been present to him before the foundation of the world. Everything you will say or do tomorrow is, is known by him and has always been known by him. And his plans are laid accordingly. Okay? So in no way was, say, Judas or the high priest or any of these people forced or in that sense, predestined against their will to do these evil things. But God always knew what they would do and had his plans laid accordingly. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's how we need to understand it. it uh, let's just say that you're uh, up on a hill and you can see two trains on one track coming toward each other. You can know what's about to happen ahead of time. Um, but you knowing it doesn't make it happen. Those engineers are acting freely or the track guy who didn't switch the thing acted freely. Um, and it's going to happen, but you're knowing and seeing it ahead of time doesn't make it happen. All right. If that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Good. Glad you asked. Thank you. Okay. Now we'll go to the concluding statement for this chapter. Uh, why don't you go there? Uh, Katie? I think that's, what is it? Uh, verse uh, 32. Is that right? Uh, hang on a second. Uh, I've got to unmute you. Sorry. Okay, try again. Now, the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for... As many owned lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Okay. And that last remark we'll just look at real quickly first. That introduces us to Barnabas, who will play a significant role uh, in, when we pick up the story of St. Paul and his conversion. Right now we're in the Acts of Peter, but we are introduced here to Barnabas. Now, I want to say that many people say, you see, communism is really the, 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 uh, the New Testament way, uh, because everybody sells everything and, and nobody has anything private. They all sell and have everything in common. And isn't this wonderful, and this is communism, and therefore the church should be supportive of communism. So let's make some distinctions, of course. Um, first of all, uh, it's a freely willed arrangement into which they enter, it, whereas atheistic communism was forced on people. The state just simply usurped all ownership of everything. So that's hardly uh, free, <laughs> a free sort of communal living. Uh, secondly, um, this, uh, this, this arrangement uh, is, is, it would seem, if you continue to read on to the Acts of the Apostles, it would seem was a provisional one. It wasn't something that was exercised everywhere. But at this early stage, where the church was gearing up for a missionary work, uh, people uh, lived together in, in, in kind of a communal way. And by the way, we still have this form of communism in the church. Uh, it's called monastic life. Okay, so the sisters up the street own nothing. 
Everything belongs to the community, including, including the habits they wear, including their toothbrush. Now, they, that doesn't mean they don't use certain things privately, obviously their own clothes and their own toothbrush, but everything belongs to the community. None of them own a thing. Uh, any money they earn goes right to the community. They live together, they share everything in common. They have different works, but they share everything in common. And that's what's being described here. So we still have this in the church today, but it is not something that is imposed everywhere on everyone uh, because it doesn't make sense everywhere and at all times, all right? Um, what's going on here in Jerusalem at this time makes sense for them um, for reasons that aren't entirely clear to us, but it's, it works for them. And this is what they do. But um, this does not continue as you start to see the church spreading. Uh, we do see uh, private ownership and we do see that people aren't simply living in a kind of a communal or, uh, way, way described here. Okay. So are there, would there be some questions or comments about this? Because sometimes people will use a text like this to, to try to say, isn't communism just great? Um, and, and the church uh, teaches against communism, by which we mean forced communism, uh, the, the, political, the political version of it, okay? I think I heard somebody maybe trying to unmute, they had a question or, okay. So just notice the distinctions, okay? Uh, there's nothing wrong with necessarily going and living, I don't like the term commune, because it reminds you of kind of some crazy hippies and stuff. The beautiful thing is about the quote communes or the, co the, uh, the conventional communal life in the church is that these um, societies of men and women, monks and, and religious sisters have rules. Uh, when I say rules, I mean a regular, a rule of life that, that, is, that is approved by Rome. There are, there are, there's oversight. They're not just off doing their own thing. They're answerable to the local bishop and to the, uh, to the Pope or to the congregations in Rome. So there's a lot of oversight and things to keep these places from getting kind of weird. But we, we even know in our times that a few of our religious orders kind of got out of line. The Legionnaires of Christ uh, being one of them um, and some other orders that have had to be suppressed by the church. Um, so the oversight doesn't work 100%, but generally, again, these things are, uh, are not simply, these communes are not just simply self-enclosed communities. They're part of a bigger picture where some live this life and others do not. Okay? Okay, good. Um, what else? But again, he's doing one of these. This is one of those, uh, I told you, five summaries that Luke does here early in Acts. And so the church was growing and people were coming together. They were of one mind and of one soul. And as I said, Luke loves to, in these summaries, be very effusive of how wonderful it was but you know all you got to do is read a few lines here they're getting beat up they're getting arrested you know it's not all idyllic right and we're going to read on here a little bit later there's some conflicts that erupt so it's not like oh they never argued everything was fine and you know uh, there were never divisions in the church and uh, everybody got along uh, not 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 that easy not that easy but but as a general rule luke is describing though with this early experience of the church as People coming together, being united, loving one another, sharing their goods, being of one mind and one heart. They're amazed at the apostles and the power that God has given them. Uh, they're excited about what's happening in their life. So they're kind of at an early nascent stage. It's like the first few weeks of a marriage. <laughs> and then week three or four dawns and <laughs> things get tougher. <laughs> I don't mean I'm being a little facetious, but, you know, anyone who's been married more than six minutes knows that, you know, marriage can be a beautiful thing and marriage can also be a tense thing. So, and it's the same with the church. It's the same with any organization. It's just whenever you get two human beings together in a room, there's going to be politics. Okay. There's going to be tensions. There's going to be, it's just the nature of things. And uh, most of it we work through, we actually benefit from the tension, you know, no tension, no change, right? We need to sort of pressure each other and kind of have a little bit of this to, to grow. So it's not all bad. It's just a question of accepting the fact that Luke's description here may be a little on the idyllic side. Okay, good. All right, well, here we are at the end. Um, so we've gone about just about a little over an hour. Um, any last minute comments or questions um, before we end with prayer? We could. Um, unmute and ask a question or make a comment. I know that um, Chris, we need to remind them about uh, the uh, flock notes. Um, 
in effect, uh, you you have there in the chat box, if you go to, you may have received an email from us already asking you to go, but you can go to um, hcscchurch.flocknote.com and you can register there and there's going to be certain things you can sign up for. So you may not be interested in getting information from the parish about, um, oh, I don't know, um, uh, whatever, but but you're certainly interested in being on the young adult Bible study because that's your main thing. But you it doesn't mean you have to sign up for every group, but that you can sign up there and and, and indicate. And it's going to be very helpful for us to kind of be able to target. And when somebody wants to join our group, we can quickly put them in it in a way that's a little bit more difficult now. So you'll be of great help to us uh, if you can uh, sign up for flock notes. Okay. Uh, anything else, Chris, about that? That is it. Okay. All right. Um, well, listen, thanks for your attention. You know, I mean, I, I know that I kind of go on and I'm a blabbermouth, um, uh, but, but I hope you've, you've been able to find, uh, again, what, what I tried to do with you here is something called breaking open the word, where we read these lines and we study them, we try to apply them to our life today. Huh? There's three questions a person can ask when you read a, uh, and you do a Bible study. What did it mean then? What does it mean now? And what does it mean for me? Those are usually three good questions. And ideally, I try to do all three of those. Um, and I used to do a lot more of the first one. What did it mean then? Uh, I still do that at least a little bit, but I also try to show, I spend a little more time on what does it mean now and what does it mean for me? You know, and so these are because these are the things where the scriptures really come alive for us in that breaking open of the word. So it takes a little extra time to get through books this way, but um, I'm trying to cover a chapter um, a week, and so far we're on schedule. All right, good. All right, uh, a couple of thoughts, uh, just so you know, um, there are, you know, still things going on in the parish that, you know, most of you know about if you're here in D.C. The church is open every day for prayer. Um, we have adoration most days. The guys, the seminarians usually have it around five. I, it's not every day because sometimes their schedule varies. Um, we're, we're certainly offering mass for you every day. We are, um, uh, we still have a holy hour on Fridays uh, around six. Uh, I hear confessions on a regular schedule um, and um, always by appointment. And, uh, and so just, just please know that uh, if you need to come by or want to come by, the church is open. There's usually staff here from about nine in the morning until five or so in the evening if you need to come by the rectory. Uh, if you certainly feel free to call me, if you need to reach me and say, I'd like to make an appointment or talk on the phone about something. Um, so these would be the things I just want to remind you about. Okay. And I love you all and I miss you. And, um, I'm hoping that, um, uh, you'll take advantage of any opportunities that you have that the parish is continuing to offer. Okay. Good. By the way, I think I mentioned this to you. If you haven't started watching it, there's that series called the chosen really worth watching, really worth watching. I liked it enough that I sent him a hundred bucks and I'm going to send him more to start funding the second season. But it's basically how Christ called the different apostles and, and also other people like Nicodemus and Mary Magdalene. And it's just a very beautiful human portrait of them and uh, their lives. And I highly, highly recommend it to you. And the things don't go on forever. They're like 40 minutes, maybe 45 minutes segments. So it's not like, you know, uh, you have to sit there and watch something for two hours. Uh, you might want to binge watch, but uh, you don't have to. So Jesus is Catholic too. The actor who plays Jesus. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's been interviewed, and he's a very devout Catholic, by the way. He loves the Divine Mercy Chapel, goes to Mass, uh, daily Mass, and uh, it, it's just it's just a beautiful portrait of Christ and of the early apostles and disciples and how they were called. So I really recommend it. you can find it on YouTube. It's free. Okay, people like me paid for it so you could watch it for free. Okay. All right, people like me and about 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 about, uh, about uh, 1.5 million other people helped to fund it. It was really crowdsourced. It was uh, beautifully done. Okay. I uh, one thing I wanted to just ask. Um, mm -hmm. Well, this is a little bit late. It could be something we talk about more next time. But when we kept reading, um, I noticed that it just kept mentioning, you know, it's through the Holy Spirit that they were empowered and they were bold and everything, and. I guess maybe a more of a comment than a question, but I um, find that we don't really tend to talk about the Holy Spirit too much as Catholics. Like it's kind of there, but not really deeper. And 
it seems like it's really the Holy Spirit that's changing their hearts. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I know people aren't always very comfortable with the care very charismatic thing, but everyone, regardless of whether they're effusive or not, um, should be being changed by that. Right, Monty? I agree. And um, you're right. We don't talk enough about the Holy Spirit. In fact, I wrote, uh, there was a book that I read uh, a few years ago about the Holy Spirit called The Great Unknown. <laughs> we, so few people ever talk about the Holy Spirit. I will say that a lot of times when I say the Lord, um, I can easily mean the Holy Spirit or Jesus. Or God the Father. Right now, of all the three members of the Trinity, I'm personally, I have a very tender relationship with God the Father, very tender. Um, but I certainly feel the effects of the Holy Spirit in my life, and I'm so grateful to the Holy Spirit. I really am. And by the way, our church is named for the Holy Spirit, right? Holy Comforter is the title of the Holy Spirit. The walls are red for a reason. Uh, the big tongue of fire is up there over the Valdecchino for a reason, okay? So it is the church of the Holy Spirit. So thank you for that reminder, Joy, and, and also a little bit of an admonition, right? Which is, uh, we should do more of that, and be more specific in giving, giving glory to the Holy Spirit. Okay. Yeah, oh, I want to piggyback on that. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I totally agree. I think the Holy Spirit is really de-emphasized, because I didn't really learn about the Holy Spirit until I got to college and, like, went on a, a spiritual impact boot camp retreat with, with focus, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like, in college. And that was just crazy amazing, you know. It's kind of mm -hmm. crazy that I, up until age, like, 20, 20, the, you know, growing up in the Catholic Church my whole life, I'd basically never heard anything substantive about yeah. the Holy Spirit, you know. And that's, like, that's like you're missing, you're missing a third of the, the Holy yeah. Trinity. You know? uh, and that's just, I, I mean, honestly, like, yeah, I, I think it is kind of a disgrace. I mean, it is. I mean, you've talked often about, like, priests and bishops need to give better sermons and stuff like yeah you know it's kind of it's kind of, now that i think about it i think it's kind of outrageous that we we don't discuss the holy spirit i think i think maybe it's fear like fear i think it's fear of being courageous you know fear of proclaiming the holy spirit because when you say the holy spirit they're like oh like holy spirit like oh that's like what does that mean like that's so like goofy you know it's like it's like i think there's a, a widespread fear and that is of satan you know i think we need to cast out that fear and be courageous and uh say that Yes, this is the Catholic Church, and we're infallible. The, the Pope and the bishops in the Sacred Magisterium of the Catholic Church are infallibly guided by the Holy Spirit. That's one of the right. God gave us the Holy Spirit, so, so that we would have assurance and faith that the Catholic Church is the one true Church. He gave us the Holy Spirit, and without the Holy Spirit, Peter and the disciples are still cowering in an apartment in uh, in Jerusalem. Like, are you serious? Like, all the evangelization came from the Holy Spirit. So, yeah, totally uh, want to piggyback on what Joy said. Uh, that, that it's our it's our assurance that the, the you know not just from Jesus Christ but the Holy Spirit is our continuous assurance that the faith is true. You know, go go therefore, make yeah. disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Behold, I, I will be with you always to the end of the end of the, the age. You know, behold, I will be with you always. Sure, Jesus is physically present in the Eucharist, but a behold, I will be with you always to the end of the age. Like you know, the Holy Spirit is with us to the end. The Holy Spirit is literally. Uh, it's not just a charismatic thing, but from a theological perspective, it, it, it would make, it would actually, even though it's kind of funny that it's de-emphasized theologically, I think it would make sense that we would talk about the Holy Spirit the most. We should have the, the closest relationship with the Holy Spirit, right? Because the Holy Spirit is literally with us here on earth. Jesus is in, present physically in the, in the mass, you know, in the church and God is in heaven and is always with us. But wouldn't it make more theological sense? The Holy Spirit is our first encounter. And then we encounter Jesus Christ. And then we encounter God, the father. A lot of people go to Jesus first, you know, and then God, and then the Holy Spirit never, you know, but I don't know, you can make a fair argument that the Holy Spirit, it makes the most theological sense to get closest with the Holy Spirit first for faith, you know? All right, David, I think you're just getting started, man. <laughs> Good preaching. I will always say this, that we have a, um, uh, there'll be a passage much later in Acts where Paul goes into a town and asks that, you know, did they receive the Holy Spirit when they were baptized? And they say, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. <laughs> Oops. And couldn't that maybe describe a lot of Christians today? So we're going to be talking more about this as we move through Acts. So this, these are all good points. And we'll build on that foundation. You'll see that it's very much uh, part of Acts. And by the way, uh, in, in order not to divide out God, we want to always remember that the Holy Spirit is Jesus' Holy Spirit. It is the Father's Holy Spirit. Um, so in other words, it's not as though... Father's over here, Son's over here, and, and, and the Holy God, of course, is one. And uh, the Holy Spirit come, proceeds, as we say in the Tantum Ergo, procedenti abu troque, uh, comparsi laudatio, to the one who proceeds from them both, 
be equal praise and glory. So there is this, again, um, this beautiful unity that we must also not forget. Uh, when we speak of the Lord, we're speaking of the three persons. But we, you're right, we should still be able to personally speak and say more about the Holy Spirit as the third person. Yes, okay. Well, listen, let's pray. Uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. And thou shall renew the face of the earth. And the Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, well, the class has ended. Go in peace. <laughs> all right, I'll unmute you all to say quick farewells. <laughs> Thanks, Mazzini. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Monsignor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you.